Good evening and welcome to Prophetic News Tonight. We have a very urgent prophetic message from Jonathan Kahn to share with you this evening. We want you to be prepared for this upcoming season and be capable of recognizing the signs of the times. Let's go to Jonathan Kahn now. First Chronicles 12.32, the sons of Issachar understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. What are the signs of the times and how does God reveal to us to know the times and what we should do? This is not a message I've given anywhere. I've asked to do this. So I'm going to share some things, not only some prophetic revelation, but also I'm going to take you behind the scenes to share some, some of what happened behind how it came that I don't share. Now, how do we know the signs of the times? Sons of Issachar, children of Issachar. First of all things, first is the word of God. Because we can only know the times we're in if we know the time to begin with. The Lord says we are to watch and pray and be ready and be vigilant to discern the signs of the times. Among the most important signs of the times right now in the end time, number one that tells you where you are is the rebirth of the nation of Israel. The regathering of his people from the ends of the earth. The restoration to Jerusalem. And the other is the great apostasy, the great falling away that we are watching in our culture every day in Western civilization affecting the world. The Bible said both of these would take place, both have taken place and are happening. We are living in the generation that has witnessed the coming back of the nation of Israel, the return of Israel to Jerusalem, which has to happen for Messiah Jesus to come again, and that is witnessing the great apostasy. Many believers ignore the signs of the times, what's happening to the younger generation. That's crucial, it represents the future. We can't ignore it away. We have a generation in the West, which for the first time in human history, 20 to 28% of them, that's about one in five to one in three almost, identify as something other than heterosexual. That is unprecedented. We have a generation for the first time in human history, if it continues as it's going, without, the, without revival, the majority will be identifying as something other than Christian for the first time since the beginning of the church age. We've got a culture that puts on television and on the internet things that would have been unthinkable just a little while ago. What if Americans in the mid 20th century turned on their television set to see what is on now? And from the 1950s, then they saw what is happening now, they would think they're watching a nightmare apocalypse. And thus we are here where America, along with much of the West, can less and less be called a Christian civilization, more and more a post-Christian, unchristian, and anti-Christian. We have a culture in which Christians are increasingly viewed as a problem, where pastors have been put on trial for upholding the word of God, like in Canada, in Europe. And we have a generation of young adults that for the first time is not mostly pro-Israel, but pro-Hamas, and believes that what happened on October 7th with that invasion was justified. This is unprecedented. And it's shocking, except we are living by the word of God. The Bible says these things will happen. And people will be in the last days without natural affection not believing, persecuting God's people. We are watching it. Now I want to speak about what I have seen and how the Lord has spoken and guided me to encourage you to what God will show you with regard to the times and with regard to how the Lord shows us. I was standing at the, the corner of Ground Zero when I saw an object, a tree that had been struck down. And the Spirit moved me that I had to seek out that there was a mystery here. It was the beginning of the revealing of an ancient mystery. It kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger, one piece to the next, a tree, a, a stone, a tower, the connection of 9-11 to an ancient scripture warning of coming judgment. The, the, the signs that appeared in the last days of Israel to warn Israel of judgment that are now appearing on American soil. Some in New York City, some in Washington, D.C., some in the form of objects, some in, the, in touching leaders, all warning a nation that knew God to come back to God or judgment comes. I can never reproduce how God led me to write the Harbinger or any book. 
God just does. He, one thing after the other. Sometimes it would come, someone would just say something, and it would be the key that I needed for the next opening of God's word. Sometimes something would just come in my mind, and I didn't know whether it was true or not. I'd go to, the, to research it, and it was all true. At one point, as I was typing in the scripture that God had led me concerning 9-11, Isaiah 9-10, that speaks about this, this attack on a nation and how the nation responded to God's warning, Instead of the scripture coming up, my computer took me to the annals of the United States Congress, and at at that moment it was revealed to me that the day after 9-11, when America made its response to God, the Senate Majority Leader, or to the world, that he stood up on Capitol Hill, and he, he said, there's a word from Isaiah, and then he pronounced the ancient prophecy of Isaiah 9-10 that the ancient leaders of Israel said when they were attacked, and he was pronouncing judgment on America. I had no idea of that. The Lord already led me there, but I had no idea. Now let me tell you something that I only saw after I wrote The Harbinger. And I had no idea when I wrote it. It's something called the One Year Bible. I'm sure you all know it. And that is that every day there's a scripture that is appointed to be read on that day. If you open up the One Year Bible to the Harbinger scripture, Isaiah 9, 10, which is about that attack, when the attack came on Israel, the strike, the warning, and the people responded with arrogance. If you open up to that scripture, Isaiah 9, 10, about the attack, if you look on the top of the page, you'll see a date. The date in the one-year Bible is September 11th. The scripture, warning of judgment, speaking of the, uh, the first strike on the land by an enemy shaking the nation to come back to God, is there, was already in the one-year Bible uh, for 9-11. And the, and the one-year Bible came into existence in the 1980s. So every year across America, believers were opening up the Bible, or actually they're opening up the one-year Bible to the scripture of the attack on the land. It was happening every year, and then it happened on 9-11. I had no idea. But it's not just the coming of a revelation or God speaking to us. Also, God sends forth the word. God wants to warn his people. God wants his people to know what is coming. So it wasn't just the revealing, it was God sending forth. Now, I had never, here's the backstory. I had never written a book in my life. And, just, and I wrote The Harbinger, and The Harbinger just wrote itself. It was like the, the book was writing itself. The week I finished it, I had no publisher, no agent, nothing. And I had to fly out to Dallas, Texas to speak at Promise Keepers. On the way, the plane stops at Charlotte Airport. And there I'm by the gate for the next flight. I bow my head and I say, God, this message, the harbinger is your word. It's your message. It's not mine. You don't need, you don't need book agents. You don't need public. You don't need anything to get a word. You know how to get words out. So you do it by your hand. I open up my eyes, and there's a man sitting to my left. He turns to me, and he says, so what's the good word? I said, what's the good word? I said, God loves you. He said, I know that, but what's the good word? I'm thinking, this is kind of weird. I start witnessing to him. I'm trying to save him, and he's witnessing to me to try to save me. (laughs) Until we both realize we're saved. And then he says, Jonathan, you've written a book. This book is of God. And God is going to send the book forth to the nation and the world. He said, you've been known, but it's nothing compared to what will happen. You've done things, but it's nothing compared to what you will do. Then he takes out, he starts handing me $100 bills. He says, God is going to multiply your reach by 100 times. But it didn't begin there. It began on the field of the Super Bowl in 2008. Now, how many people here are into football? Okay. Okay. That's good. You know, see, me, I'm not so much. See, most Jewish people aren't into football because to us it's scary. A bunch of very big Gentiles running around after an unkosher pigskin, it's scary. <laughs> we know Moses had a right, had a written something against it, condemning it, but we can't find it. <laughs> but David Tyree of the New York Giants was a born-again Christian, and he wanted to glorify God, and he prayed, Lord, I want to I wanna spread your word. Before he went into the game, a man gave him the wor- a word and said, God is going to do something, cause something to happen that's going to cause you to go into the spotlight and you're going to glorify God. He went into the game waiting for it. The whole world's watching. He's waiting for the prophecy. Then it happened. It was called the helmet catch. It's been called the greatest catch in Super Bowl history. He caught the ball on his helmet 
and he, he, they won the game. He was made famous. He wrote a book glorifying God and mentioned the man's name who gave him that word, that prophecy, that, that, that when he went into that game. Now, that, that's how, that happened in 2008. God is in charge of every event. The man who gave him that prophetic word at the Super, for the Super Bowl was the man who was sitting next to me at the airport. He wasn't supposed to be on that flight, but his flight kept getting canceled because of the weather until he was forced on my flight. And he just happened to sit down right next to me as I happened to pray that prayer, God send it forth. And he said he was overtaken by the Spirit telling him, you got to speak to this man, but he resisted it. He said, no, Lord, I'm not going to do that. You see, for some strange reason, you won't believe it, but he thought I looked Jewish. <laughs> I know. And I'm wearing black, and he thought I was Orthodox. I'm going like this, and he said, I can't give it to him. He's Jewish. Until he, and he says, God, he said, literally, had, it was, he was struck by pain all over until he opened his mouth and gave me that word. So because David Tyree caught that ball on his helmet and wrote that book, it put this, mentioned the man's name, that man was put in touch with Steve Strang, one of the Christian, great Christian publishers. It was all a setup from the Super Bowl. So the man at the airport sent word to Steve Strang of charisma, and he said, you'll never believe what happened. At the airport, a while later, I get a communication from the president of Charisma who says, we heard what happened at the airport. We heard about this thing called the Harbinger. We have no idea what it is, but we're interested. And that is how the Harbinger went forth to the world, not by the hand of man, but by the hand of God. That's how God works. Now, let me tell you how another mystery came, and, 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 and I wasn't, I'm lying on my bed. My wife is lying next to me. I'm awake. She's asleep, and three revelations come into my head. I have no idea if they're real or not. I get up, I go into the other room, get out my laptop, I look it up, it's all real, and I'm blown away. And that was part of the beginning of a revelation that would become the book, The Paradigm. Now, The Paradigm is a mystery that reveals there is a template in the Bible that actually the leaders of our time and the events of our time are following. I'll give you an example. In The Paradigm, uh, there is, well, there is a man, there is Ahab. Now, the president of the 1980s, Bill Clinton, doesn't know it, but he was following that pattern of Ahab. He was on, Bill Clinton was on the national stage for 22 years. It's written, Ahab was king in Samaria for 22 years. Ahab was part of a culture war. He was a divided man, so was Bill Clinton. In the paradigm, I'm just giving you a very quick thing. Barack Obama follows the pattern of King Joram, who came after Ahab. Barack Obama was on the national stage from 20, 2004 to 2016, exactly 12 years. It's written that King Joram reigned in Samaria for exactly 12 years. In the paradigm, the queen, how should I say this? I want to be nice. The wife of King Ahab <laughs> continued after Ahab's reign came to an end. She remained on the national stage in the capital city. The wife of Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, continued on after the end of the Clinton presidency in the capital city. Hillary Clinton was on the national stage for 22 years with her husband, on her own in public life, public office, or running for president, 14 years. 22 years with her husband, 14 years after. The ancient queen, the wife of King Ahab, was on the national stage for 22 years with her husband, on her own, 14 years. But then comes another figure. His name is Jehu. He will be the mystery of Donald Trump. Trump will follow the template and mystery of Jehu without knowing it. Jehu was wild, unpredictable. You never knew what Jehu was going to say next. I mean, I believe there's evidence in the Bible that Jehu had a Twitter account, but we're not going there. We're not going there. Jehu wasn't political. He was a fighter. Donald Trump fights with everybody. In fact, there, you know, Jehu began a race to the throne. Donald Trump began a race to the White House. Jehu made an alliance with the religious conservatives of the land. Donald Trump made an alliance with the religious conservatives of the land. Jehu, Jehu actually invited uh, one of her, a religious conservative into his chariot on the race to become his partner, who was a religious conservative. So has Donald Trump. In order to become the leader of the land, Jehu had to, had to, had to have come face to face in a showdown against the nation's former first lady. In order to become the leader of America, Trump had to have a showdown face to face with the nation's former first lady. All the polls said Hillary Clinton was going to trounce Donald Trump. 
But the paradigm in the Bible said the one who walks in the shoes of Jehu will prevail. And so he did. Now, now let me just tell you a little secret there. Now, it's one of the things I got when I was on my bed, while I'm lying on my bed, concerned King Ahab. King Ahab was caught in a scandal. He, his reign had scandal. Well, Bill Clinton's reign also had scandal. Ahab's scandal was exposed in the, his 19th year of his reign. The 19th year of Bill Clinton on the national stage was 1998. 1998 was when the scandal was exposed, 19th year of his reign. Clinton was sworn into power in 79 on, in, as a governor on January 20th. 19 years later, it takes you to January 20th, 1998, the scandal breaks out on that very day. Now it came to be in bed the, that in one, moment, that in one moment, Ahab confesses his sin over the scandal and repents. His repentance doesn't last, he goes back, but he repented. Well, well, the thing is, Clinton also, he, he, uh, first he denied it, but then he admitted it. He confessed it at a, at a White House meeting uh, uh, after, months after. Well, with, when Ahab does that, he confesses it. Three years later, there's a calamity that comes on the land. Well, if you take the, the day that Bill Clinton confessed, finally confessed, and take three years later... It leads you to the day, September 11, 2001. In fact, it takes you to the morning and the exact hour. There are no accidents. That was one of the things that came, and I had no idea God just, just speaks to us. Now, one of the mysteries from the, this, this revelation of the paradigm is an, it, it's an event that came true after the paradigm came out. It was three years later. And so I also wrote in the Josiah Manifesto that it came true. And that is that is that... This happened, the template foretells in the Bible that the one that Jehu he calls for a gathering in the capital city. Now, during that gathering, the people of Jehu surround a great capital building and then they storm the building in the Bible. Well, that would all manifest on January 6th. Now, the Capitol Police announced they had arrested on site. The first arrest was they made an arrest in Washington. They announced and made headlines that we arrested 80 people involved in this. In the Bible, the account of Jehu, when his, he, calls for the, the, he calls for a gathering in capital city. It, it spe the words in Hebrew appear, shmonim ish. It speaks of the number of people who went into that great ancient capital building, that temple. It translates to 80 people, the exact same. There are so many mysteries we don't have time for. But I want to say something else. This is how another thing came, how God speaks to us. I was led, this is, I was led to go to Canada. I was asked to go to Canada in 2017 to speak. And I was led to speak about the mystery of the Jubilee of God. But it turned out I had no idea, but that year was Canada's Jubilee. The hotel I'm staying in, I look and I see, I see signs in the hotel. It says 50 years celebration. It was the hotel's Jubilee. As I'm preaching in a large church, there are words on the back of the wall that say 50 years Jubilee. It was the church's Jubilee. Everywhere I went, it was Jubilee. I was bombarded by Jubilee. God was leading me to the next mystery or signs. It would have to do with the Jubilee. And an event would happen right after I got that that would touch the world. In the year of Jubilee, if you lost your land, the year of Jubilee, you got it back. It would be restored. And you would return to what you lost. There is no people on earth who have so lost their land as the Jewish people. But God promised that in the end times, he would bring them back to the land. The amazing thing is he brought them back according to the mystery of the Jubilee. The Jubilee is the 50th year. The 50th year. Now, I'm just going to give you a quick nutshell. But the first restoration of Israel began in 18, the year 1867 when the Sultan of Turkey releases the land that it could be redeemed back. Well, that's what it began. That was 1867. Count 50 years to the next one. It takes you to 1917. Anything happen? 1917, the, when, when the Jubilee comes, those who have your land have to flee. Well, 1917, the Turks flee the land of Israel after hundreds of years. The British come in, World War I, and they issue the Balfour Declaration, which promises the land of Israel to the original ancestral owner, the Jewish people. It's the year of Jubilee. But they never got Jerusalem. Count 50 years, and where does it take you? It takes you to 1967. Anything happen? 1967, the Six-Day War breaks out. 
The soldiers of Israel enter the gates of their holy city after 2,000 years, and Jerusalem, God gives Jerusalem back to Israel. That has to happen. If that didn't happen, Jesus can't come back because he's coming back to Jerusalem with the Jewish people. So God does it again, year of Jubilee. But when you get, when you, in the year of Jubilee, you don't just get your land, you get the legal right. They, you are recognized, but the world refused to recognize Jerusalem. Refused. Even, even America never did. But count 50 years to the next Jubilee, and where does it take you? It takes you to the year 2017. Did anything happen? In 2017, the United States president, Donald Trump, issues the Jerusalem Declaration that for the first time since ancient times recognizes Jerusalem as the legal possession of the nation of Israel, eternal capital. Jubilee! Now, I'm sure Donald Trump was not studying the original Hebrew. He probably just woke up and said, you know what, I feel like doing it today, you know. But God is in charge of all things. God is in charge of all things. Now, I told you, you know, when I'm in Canada, when I got this, it was 2017. It was, it was in November, and it turns out the very next month was going to be that event, that Jerusalem proclamation. God knows the future. We don't, but God does know. And if we're open, if you're open to God, he's going to lead you even when you don't know what you're doing. You don't have to know what you're doing. You just have to know the one who does, who that's it. And follow him. And say, Lord, where is it? Be open. When Israel turned away from God, it turned to other gods. There's a biblical warning from Messiah that applies not only to the people but, and, and, uh, and back then, but to nations. He spoke the parable. He spoke, he says, a man who's delivered of a demon, he says, he said, basically, if the man stays empty of God, though the, the spirit's going to come back into him. And it's going to bring seven other spirits. Now we think, okay, that's about a person. Well, yeah, you know, it's dangerous. You don't turn away from God. But it's not just that. He said, so it, is, so it will be with this generation. It's not just a person, but an entire generation can turn away from God, entire culture, and if it turns away from God, the spirits that were cast out of it will come back into it. That is a warning to America and to the world. You see, any nation, any civilization that has known God has been delivered of paganism, turns away from God, those ancient spirits are coming back into it. And you want to understand what's happening to America and much of the world? It's this. We turned from God and the spirits came back. And so we are watching a repossession or a repaganization. That's why it's so crazy. Why are they getting into this? Why this? It's all part, it's going back to paganism. And see, that's what we did. And the thing is, when I looked at ancient Israel, and the Lord led me and said, this has to be the next thing. you got to get this word out. When it, when it turned away from God, there were three major gods or spirits that came into the culture. And as I looked, I saw the same three principalities happening in our world that have come back. I call it, in the, this, this led to the return of the gods. And I open up the mystery of what I call the dark trinity, the three. The first one is called the possessor. That's what his name means. The second one is, the, or the other one is the destroyer. And another is a goddess, the enchantress. The enchantress is the, god, the ancient goddess of sexual immorality. She seduces, now coming back, she will seduce a Judeo-Christian civilization to turn it pagan in the realm of sexuality. She was known as the goddess who, listen, who bends and alters gender. In her ancient inscription, she says, I am a woman, I am a man. She says in her, the ancient Babylonian and Assyrian inscription says that she turned, this one, this spirit, turns a man into a woman and a woman into a man. That is what we are dealing with right now. This is the, the spirit that is changing gender, destroying marriage, destroying children. We removed God from our schools. You know, we thought, okay, not a big deal. No, a real big deal, because that was the future. We remove, when you take God out of the schools, something else is coming into the schools. If you take God from the children, something else will come into the children. You know, the goddess, this ancient goddess, this spirit, especially possessed the culture in one month. And you know what the month was? The month of June. With parades that celebrated the altering of gender. One of the signs of this goddess, 
listen, was the rainbow. Why is the rainbow taking over all this stuff? Why is the rainbow replacing the cross? You know, well, I, I have to say something, though. The rainbow does not belong to a goddess or to man. The rainbow belongs to God, period. It is his sign. But you know, this, when I looked at the ancients, this ancient spirit, it actually, the goddess takes things that belongs to other gods and, and uses, turns it around, twists it. Well, that's exactly what's happening. And you know, there were three Supreme Court decisions that altered sexuality and marriage. They all took place in June. It was over a 12-year period, but each one was handed down on the exact same day, a day that is linked to the mystery of this goddess. And I looked, I looked up, you know, the night, remember, when marriage was altered after, after thousands of years and the president lit up the White House in the colors of the rainbow to celebrate it, the altar that a man could marry a man. Well, I looked in the ancient, the, ancient, the ancient writings of the Middle East. It turns out on the Babylonian calendar, that happened. That was, the White House was lit up on the 10th day of Tammuz. It's also the biblical calendar. 10th day of Tammuz. Well, I looked up that. And it turns out, it says in the ancient, those ancient writings, the 10th day of Tammuz is ordained to cast a spell to cause a man to love a man. That is the day that marriage was altered. Now, there is so much more. I'm just giving you taste, but also how God reveals these things. And we don't have time. I wanted to speak more about the Josiah Manifesto, but there's so much. But I will just say this. It began with a, actually that, this began with a vision that one of my pastors, one of my associate pastors, had a vision, and, and he, he told me I was in the vision and had to do with altars and gods, and he didn't know, nobody knew I was writing The Return of the Gods, but it actually had a word that when I finished writing it, something would happen. The day that I finished writing The Return of the Gods about the gods and the altars, you know the great, biggest altar in America was Roe versus Wade, on which we, alter, we offered up millions of children. The day I finished writing The Return of the Gods, that altar was cracked open. And so this, this mystery, I can't really go into it now, but it also involved things like I was, I was invited by Fidel Castro to come into the presidential palace of Cuba. And I can't, was led to go there with three objects to give him. One was a, you know, he, he banned the Bible, so I gave him a Bible with his name inscribed on it. <laughs> but the other two objects actually were given, foretold when his reign would end how much time was left when God would remove him down to the, the year, the month, the week, the day, and the hour. And it actually involved a mystery that links up with America, and even, even a mystery that even gives the exact, gave the exact day that COVID, this plague, would, would arrive on our soil to the exact day, and exactly how many Americans would be struck down. And a prophetic event that I saw with my own eyes that involved President Trump. Actually, should I share that? I don't have it in my notes. I'm not, I didn't plan it. I'm not saying, I actually have a video, but I don't have the video here because I didn't plan it. All right, I'm just going to say this. When all these things were happening, uh, when COVID came and the summer of rage and we were all locked down, everything was going crazy, the Lord had led me and another man of God to call for a national day of prayer and repentance. It was called The Return. And we met, we gathered thousands, tens of thousands of Christians gathered on the National Mall and there were millions watching. We're praying repentance. Rep we're praying for America. And I was really led that we had to pray against the killing of babies. And we know, we know that this issue is not over, but we know God did something gigantic. But it was then, it was 2020. And we're praying that. I was even led to take a, a vessel of Jeremiah, like Jeremiah had that vessel. The Lord let me go down to Washington, get a vessel, and smash it when you talk about this, when you talk about the children, and when you talk about America, as he did. And so what I said, at the very end, I was led that at 5 o'clock, we had to seal all the prayers we had a, with a sounding of God's power, the sounding of the shofar. So, so at that moment, I, at around 5 o'clock, I said, come on up. I said, whoever's got shofars, six men came up, and they had talis, and they, they're getting ready to sound. And I said to everybody, as soon as you hear the sound of the shofar, shout the shout of Jericho. And so I said, now let the power of God go forth. We seal all the prayers. Let the power of God go forth. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua, go, I said. They sound, the trumpet sound, and the people shout. 
Now, at, on that day, at that, on the White House lawn, is standing President Trump. And at his side is Amy Coney Barrett. Donald Trump had chosen that day, by God, he didn't know, that day to set in motion. That was going to be the vote, the deciding vote that was going to overturn Roe versus Wade. He set it in motion on that day. That day. That turned out to be the return, which also turned out to be a Hebrew day. We didn't even know it. The biblical Hebrew day, which is called the day of return and repentance when a nation is to turn away from evil. Donald Trump chose that same day to turn away from the evil of abortion. And he sets it in motion. But the thing was, you know, not just that. It wasn't just that day. Donald Trump decided to set it in motion at 5 o'clock which is when we were going to do that prayer and we sounded the trumpet. Now, the thing is, it wasn't just that. We looked at the, looked at the videotape, and when I said go, the, I said sound, the trumpet sound, they sounded. It was 5 o'clock, 4 minutes, and 33 seconds. Donald Trump opened his mouth and began the overturning of Roe versus Wade at 5 o'clock, 4 minutes, and 33 seconds. The exact same second. God is amazing. He's in charge of everything. The same God of the Bible, of Jericho. You know, Rovers was overturned with the sound of Jericho at that moment. And I said, God, you're amazing. I mean, he knows that, but God, you're amazing. I said, but, when I looked, I said, you know, you could have done one thing better. See, it's always good to correct God if he doesn't do something the way you think he should. I said, everything was perfect except one thing. You know, there were six trumpets. There should have been seven, you know. Jericho, seven. Revelation, seven trumpets. Why six? And then it hit me. So wait a minute. What is the name of your president? Trump. The tr he was the seventh trumpet. Trump was the seventh trumpet. I said, let the trumpet sound, and the trump sounded. <laughs> At that moment. God is amazing. God is amazing. Okay, that's what I was not going to share with you. And that's some of it. But that's some of it linked to, that's what, what opened up the, that's what began the Josiah Manifesto. Now, now I'm going to share one more how God reveals and how things happen. It was a Friday night. It was, I was at Beth Israel, that's the congregation I lead in New Jersey, uh, in Wayne. And that night, I was led to share about a mystery from Leviticus. And it, it was, it was a, that mystery that I opened, and I'm not saying I know all these things. God, though, does. That mystery would ordain that there would be an attack on Israel. It would be an invasion of Israel that would take Israel by surprise. The mystery ordained that the attack would happen in the year 2023. That it would happen in the autumn of that year, specifically in the month of October. The mystery ordained it would take place on a Saturday, the Sabbath day. It would happen on a Hebrew holy day linked to Leviticus. It would take place on the first Saturday of October of 2023. When Hamas invaded the land of Israel, it took Israel by surprise. It happened in the year 2023. It happened in the month of October. They attacked on a Saturday, the Sabbath day. It all happened on a Hebrew holiday, holy day from Leviticus. Hamas invaded on the first Saturday of October of 2023. Now, when I shared this mystery, it was Friday, the next morning it happened. And people who were at the service said, you just spoke about that. And that be, that's what opened up and began the, the, what, I just, what just God just gave me, which was the dragon's prophecy. And this one mystery that, that I put in there that actually began the book may even enable us to know future events, what is going to come, and exactly when it's going to come. After I finished writing the manuscript, three other events happened according to the same exact mystery. Now, there's one mystery in the Dragon's Prophecy that actually begins in the 20th century. It's a prophetic countdown of thousands of days. And when you take the countdown, thousands of days, it pinpoints, lands on the morning of October 7th, Saturday, with the invasion. That's how precise God is. We are to know the signs of the times. And, when, and, and we have to be open to God interrupting us too. You know, if you want to be led by God, you got to be interruptible. I wasn't planning on writing this book, the last book I didn't plan on it. I was planning on writing the sequel to The Return of the Gods, which I will write, but God interrupted me. 
totally. Well, number one, he interrupted me with that mystery when it all happened and what happened in Israel. And then when I'm seeking his will, Lord, what, do you want me to write a, this other book that I didn't plan on writing? I saw an image of a dragon, a red dragon. I knew this was from Revelation 12. That's what began the dragon's prophecy. Now, speaking of the signs of the times, you know, as I start writing the book in the beginning of this year, 2024, I had no idea. You know what? It turns out that 2024 is called the year of the dragon. So here I'm writing about the dragon. There's a comet that comes by the earth every, about every 70 years. And the year it came by, this, this year, 2024, it's come by the earth. The, dragon, the, the comet is called the Mother of Dragons Comet. That same year, this spring, all over New York City, images appear, start appearing, I don't know if you saw it, images start appearing of dragons all over the city. And one of the ways we know, you know, we know, this began this, we know the signs of the times because we have to know the word of God. There is a word of God from the prophet Ezekiel, destined for the end times, in which he says, Israel has to come back from the nations, will come back to the land, and when they do that, after that, in that time, in those days, there will be an invasion, there'll be an alliance of nations that will come against Israel. He names the nations. We can identify a number of them. The amazing thing is, Every one of the nations that are prophesied or that we can identify that are prophesied to take part in an invasion of Israel, which will happen in the future, for the first time in history actually took part in the invasion of Israel on October 7th. They all had a part in what Hamas did. We crossed a prophetic line for the first time. One of the nations that Ezekiel mentions is Iran. It is foretold that Iran will attack Israel. But Iran has never directly attacked Israel until now. It was this very spring when it's launched hundreds of missiles against the Holy Land. First time in history, this is another prophetic line. The man who presided over Iran when this happened was named President Ibrahim Raisi. Abraham, he's named after Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. From Abraham comes, that name comes the Abrahamic covenant. And the covenant says, if you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. If you curse Israel, you'll be cursed. Whatever you do to Israel, it's going to come back at you. Abraham Racy sought to bring destruction on Israel. He touched the apple of God's eye. One month later, he was struck down dead. His helicopter mysteriously comes down. And in those days, he had also threatened that he was going to annihilate, bring Israel to, there'll be nothing left of Israel. He's going to, that's blasphemy. Because Israel is the nation God put into existence, and it's not going to be annihilated. The day before he was struck down, there was a scripture appointed to be read on that day from ages past on that day. All the synagogues of the world are opening the scrolls, and Israel, they're opening the scrolls, and they're reading that scripture. That scripture ends with the last words are, the one who spoke the blasphemy shall be struck down. In the prophecy of Ezekiel, God says to the enemies of his nation, I will bring you against the mountains. You will fall upon the mountains. The Iranian president is the first leader of a, a nation mentioned by Ezekiel to actually strike Israel. Where was he brought down? Against the mountains. He fell upon the mountains. You know, what we're seeing in the world, God is behind it. I mean, what I'm saying is this. What we're seeing in the world, you can only understand when you know God. And when he, you remove the veil, it's the spiritual. Let me give you an example, speaking of Iran. In the Bible, it speaks about an entity called the Sar Paras. Is it, this is an ancient entity, entity that is, that it is, its mission it to, is to war against Israel and stop God's purposes on Israel, particularly in the last days. The Sar Paras. Well, what does that mean? Sar means ruler, leader, general, and Paras means the nation of Iran. So the Bible is saying there is a spirit behind the nation of Iran. And this, and you want to understand Iran? Why is Iran so obsessed with destroying Israel? Because it is being moved by a principality that is obsessed with destroying Israel. The Bible says it. And so that's why Iran is behind everything, you know, behind Hezbollah today, right? It's Iran. 
Behind Hamas, you know, October 7th, Gaza. Behind Gaza is Hamas. Behind Hamas is Iran. Behind Iran is the Sarparas. And behind the Sarparas is the dragon, the devil. But you know what the button So that's why Iran is obsessed with destroying it. That's why it's the arch enemy. The Bible explains it. But you know what else? The Bible says that there's another entity called the Tsar Yisrael or the leader, ruler, or, or general of Israel that protects Israel. And now you know what this entity, it has a name. The name of this entity means in Hebrew, who is like God. In Hebrew, the way you say that is me, chai, el, or we call him Michael. If you're real spiritual, you call him Mike, but that's, we're not going there. The Bible actually says that Michael, Michael, is actually right now protecting Israel. In the end times, it says he'll fight for your people in the end times. Well, it's amazing because Iran, so you got, you got the Sar Paras, this entity on one side, you got the Sar Israel on the other side, they are warring in the heavenly, and that's why Israel and Iran are warring on earth. Everything on earth links to the heavenlies. And you know when Israel sent in, I mean, so when, when Iran sent all those missiles, hundreds of missiles into Israel, you know, virtually none of them struck. They were struck down. You now they said, well, you know, you have the missile defense system. Well, there's a, there's a, a person who's, who studies statistics. He said there's no way that system could have gotten all that in that time. There had to be something else. Well, there was something else. There is a principality, the Tsar Yisrael from God. You know, I said, you know, behind this, well, with Israel, behind the defense of Israel, you have the Israeli Defense Force. Behind the IDF is the Tsar Yisrael, Michael. Behind Michael is Messiah, and Messiah is God. So they're, they're going to they're gonna win. There's another scripture that bears witness to the signs of the times. Revelation, yet to happen on one side, but Revelation 12 speaks about the dragon, the enemy, and he's warring against a woman who's got 12 stars on her head, and she gives birth to Messiah. This is Israel. Only Israel gave birth to Messiah, has the 12 stars. So the enemy hates Israel. That's why the world hates the Jewish people, because the enemy knows he, if he destroys Israel, he can stop the purposes of God, but he can't do that, but he's trying all the time. You know, it says that in Revelation, he spewed forth a flood to flood away, wipe away the woman, a flood of water. Well, you know, October 7th. You know, Hamas doesn't call it October 7th. You know what they call it? They have a code name. You know what they call it? The name is Operation Tufan in Arabic. You know what Tufan means? The flood, as in the flood of the dragon. There's something else. You know, when God speaks of the, the, the enemies of Israel that are going to come down in Ezekiel, they're going to come down on Israel. It says, you'll come like a storm on the land. Well, you know, the word Tufan means flood from Revelation, but it also means storm from Ezekiel. It's a shadow of what will be happening. Something else happened, which was a shadow, signs of the times. In the wake of October 7th, something strange happened all over the world. A rage, hatred, fury, not against Hamas, but against Israel. It was as if it was like a blood-feeding frenzy in the, spirit, in the demonic realm. Because you'd expect the world, when, when, when an enemy attacks and kills fathers and children and mothers, you'd expect there to be sympathy, but they actually raged against Israel. And you can see it, not just in the Middle East, but in Europe and America, in Harvard University. And they chanted, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. They were chanting for the destruction of Israel. You see, but, but the enemy's fingerprints were all over it because you know where that comes from? The, the enemy's the one who takes things of God and he twists them around. You know where it comes from? It comes from the Bible. When God comes from the promise that God gave to Israel, uh, giving the land to them, he says again and again, from the river to the sea, from the river to the sea, I have given you this land. So the enemy is all over this. It's written in the book of Revelation that the dragon, out of his mouth comes these spirits that go out into the world. They go out into the world, and they gather the whole world together against Israel at Armageddon. Well, you know, people say, well, how can that be? How can the nations come, against, all the nations against this little tiny land of Israel? Well, you've already seen the, the shadow of it. it all ha you already saw it when the world erupted. That was the most widespread hatred of Israel in world history. And you know what? Most young Americans are for Hamas. I said that. And they are also, you know, this, this, you want to see the future? 
without, unless there's revival. Now I'm going to share one more, one more thing here, and then I'm going to bring this home to what do we do. One more thing, one more mystery I mentioned in the Dragon's Prophecy. You know, in the Bible, there is something called, there, there, there is the colors of the apocalypse. And you see it when you look at the four horsemen. The first horse, white for conquest. The second, red for war. The third, black for famine. And the last one, green, we call it the pale horse, green for death. Well, you know what? When all these, these eruptions rage against Israel, which comes from the dragon, it's the dragon's rage, all over the world, the colors of the apocalypse started manifesting. How? They gathered together around a banner. The banner was the flag of Palestine. The flag of Palestine are the colors are white for the white horse, red for the red horse, black for the black horse, and green for the green horse. And every nation that has those colors, it marks them as an enemy of Israel. We must know and not miss the signs of the times. What does all this tell you? I just gave you a taste. I want to do the best I could to give you a taste of some of these things and also how God reveals them. What does it tell you? It tells you that our God is real. Our God is mighty. And our times are in his hands. When he gives a word, he's going to keep it. When he gives a promise, his promise is true. It tells you that our God is on the throne over everything. He's on the throne and he's got no intention of getting off of that throne. What does it tell you? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got you and me, baby, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. The children of Issachar knew the times and what Israel should do. If we know the times, then we must know what to do. The last part that God led me in the, in this, in the newest, in the dragon's prophecy is revealing the war that is against all of us. It's not just Israel. The dragon is against all of us because it says he went out to make war against the rest of her children. Who, is the children. who are the rest of the children of Israel? It's you. If you're born again, you're a child of Israel. You are a, child, you're a spiritual Israelite. And so in the last days, he's going to war again. He's going to come against Israel even more so to destroy them, and he will come against the people of God. The enemy hates you. And in fact, in fact, not only that, if you're in the image of God, which most of you are, He's been warring against you since you were conceived. He wants to oppress you, wants to, wants to addict you, wants to defile you, wants to turn you from God, wants to discourage you, wants to paralyze you. He wants to do that. But you know, this is why it's real important. You know, we gotta remember what side we're on. See, if you're in a, if you're in a fight and you don't know you're in a fight, you're not gonna win. But if you're in a fight and you don't know the power you have and who's with you, also. If the world is growing increasingly dark with the enemy, then we, the lights of God, have to grow increasingly bright for God. If the world is going from bad to worse, it's time for us, the people of God, to go from good to great. In the book of Revelation, it's not just a dragon, it's something else, the lamb. The lamb is a dragon and a lamb. You see, evil always comes like a dragon, tries to overwhelm you, intimidate you, terrorize you. And good comes like a lamb. It often seems the odds are against it. It seems like the underdog is not going to win. It seems like if you're being overwhelmed, how am I going to do this? And if you see, but you see a fight of a dragon and a lamb, most people would put their bets on the dragon. But in the Bible, it's the lamb who wins against the dragon. For in the end, it is the lamb who is victorious. It is the lamb who reigns. The lamb is Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, the king of kings. You know, dragons are reptilian. They're cold-blooded. You know, reptiles can, can go crazy, but they can't last. They have no endurance. Evil cannot, will not win because it cannot win. Evil is cold-blooded. It can't go on. But the lamb is warm-blooded. The good cannot lose. It cannot cease. It goes on forever. His love endures forever. It does not fail. In the end, evil it will perish. In the end, good shall prevail. And so in the same dragon, the same vision of the dragon, Revelation 12, it says, but, he warred against the rest of her children, but it says, but, remember this, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. The word of the testimony, loving not their lives. The word overcome there is the Greek word nakao. Say it, nakao. 
The cow is an amazing thing because it's, it means totally conquer, but it's of the future, but it's written in the past tense. In other words, your victory is as good as done. You just have to fight. The victory is as good as done. you got to remember, no matter what's happening in the world, no matter what it tells you, you still are on the winning side, and you got to claim that. you gotta, you got you to gotta prevail. you got to proclaim that. The victory is as good as done, but you can't have the victory if you don't fight. There's no, you can't have a victory without a fight. Fight the good fight. Fight what God said to you to do. Don't give up. Keep going. If you keep going, you win. For all who keep going win the fight. For despite public opinion, despite CNN, despite Hollywood, you are on the winning side. You fight your good fight. And one last sign to tell you to encourage you about the signs of the times, not just of these times, but of all times on earth. You see, for thousands of years, the dragon has tried to destroy the woman, the people of Israel. And they seem to be the weakest people. They had no defense. They had no army. They had, no, they had all hell against them for thousands of years against all odds, you know. The pharaohs of Egypt tried to destroy them. Assyria tried to crush them. Babylon tried to wipe them out. Rome tried to destroy them. Hitler tried to annihilate them. The Soviet Union tried to, to crush them. The terrorists are trying to wipe them out. But, but, the pharaohs are gone. Assyria is no more. Babylon has fallen. Rome has crumbled. Hitler has perished. The Soviet Union has collapsed. The terrorists will not be. But, 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 the nation of Israel lives. Am Yisrael Chai. The nation of Israel lives because the God of Israel lives. Because the Messiah of Israel lives. Because Yeshua, Jesus of Israel lives. Because salvation of Israel lives. And you who follow him, you shall live. You shall overcome. You shall prevail. You shall be victorious. For greater is he in you you than he was in the world. Greater is the lamb in you than the dragon in the world. So arise, man of God. Arise, woman of God. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In the name above every name, the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the light of the world, the glory of Israel, and the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. I'll see you. Thank you for tuning in to Prophetic News tonight. We hope you subscribe to stay updated on the latest in the realm of prophecy. 